Say hi. Tracy Hall just joined. And nice to nice to see you on here again. Ah, there's another Berman in the in the field. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Hello from Texas, Kansas City. North Carolina, Florida and California. New Hampshire and Maine, we're hitting corners of the United States. Very exciting. Hello, Boris from Chile, hello. Anderson, Indiana. Boston College. Hi, Mary Lane from New Hampshire, Raleigh, North Carolina. This is fabulous. Thank you all for introducing yourselves in the chat. And it is one o'clock PM Eastern time. And so I'm going to kick us off. Welcome everyone. I'm Allison Posey and I am honored to be the host of our cast free webinar today. I'm located just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And it's great as we were mentioning to have many of you introducing yourselves in the chat already. Uh, in our time together today, we have the opportunity to meet CAST's new CEO, Lindsay Jones. We'll learn more about what's inspired her work and her advocacy. She'll share about the potential she finds in universal design for learning and the impact it can have on the lives and experiences of learners everywhere. Our own CAST board chair, Shelley Berman, will facilitate the discussion. But before we begin, as you know, <laughs> we wanna make sure that you can contribute to the conversation as we really hope this is conversational. You can open the chat panel from your webinar controls. Please remember to choose everyone from the dropdown above where you type. You can add your questions to the Q&A pop-up. In fact, you can get started asking your questions now or at any time, at any point during our discussion. And whether you're participating now or listening to the recording, you can share your questions, comments, and ideas through Twitter. So please use the at cast underscore UDL, and that's all capitalized. You can use at LD underscore advocate, so capitalize the LD and the A of advocate, and at cast PL, all capitalized. I also want to thank our captioner. Thank you, Lisa, for joining us today. You can select the live transcript option to activate those captions if you prefer to have that option. And in addition, we have a digital handout for today's webinar. It has an outline of the discussion topics, links that we're mentioning during the discussion, as well as additional information about Lindsay, Shelley, and CAST. So please feel free to visit that bit.ly. So it's bit.ly slash Lindsay Jones, CEO. So all one word, you capitalize the LJ and CEO. So bit.ly slash Lindsay Jones, CEO to access that content. So without any further ado, uh, I am really pleased to get to welcome CAS board chair, Sheldon Berman. So Shelly is the AASA lead superintendent for social emotional learning. He recently retired after serving for 28 years as superintendent, and he was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Superintendent Association. He has served on CAS board since 2006 and has been the chair since 2015. Thank you for taking time to be with us today, Shelly, and congratulations on that honor. Um, I'm now going to actually turn the discussion over to you to introduce Lindsay and kick us off. Well, thank you very much, Allison. And uh, it's wonderful to be here and it's wonderful to share a little bit about uh, Cass' work. And it's incredibly exciting to welcome Lindsay Jones onto the the cast team and to lead the cast team. Um, and I'm looking forward to the conversation we have today and the, the insights that we can share and, and the future directions that cast is, is going to take. Um, let me begin by saying something about uh, my commitment to you know, why a superintendent would invest you know, his time or her time in, uh, in supporting the work of cast. And I, I think that as I look at education, I see the, the, the issues that we confront, so many issues about how to reach all children. 
and how to extend our effectiveness to the margins of, of all students, but also to, to learn how we can transform education to be more engaging, uh, more effective. And when I uh, first learned of CAST, which is back when I was a superintendent in Hudson, Massachusetts, I was fascinated by the work that CAST was doing. I mean, the, the history of CAST is a history of innovation. And it's an extraordinary uh, history. I remember when, uh, you know, beginning in 1984, which makes us almost 40 years old, um, which is quite an achievement for a nonprofit. But I remember things like Wiggle Works coming out and Thinking Reader and, and Science Writer and Book Builder. Um, but also that, that CAST was on the forefront of research, design, uh, policy, uh, always pushing the field to look at how can we be more inclusive? How can we stretch the work? And I, I think we right now are at a dramatic inflection point uh, in education. The uh, COVID has really revealed to us uh, the, the extent to which we have capability to transform education, but also the imperative that we do so. And so I think this is a critical moment and that CAST is able to uh, bring on board a, a new CEO who has spent her entire career fighting for students at, on the margins. And it's a, I think we have a, a special opportunity and uh, this is a special organization. So I've been pleased to commit the years that I've been involved in. And I continue to be excited by the breakthroughs that uh, CAS presents to the field and, and the future of uh, really transforming education and uh, the, the work that we do in such a significant way. So um, it's been a joy to work with the, the staff and to participate. And I would encourage uh, all of those who are listening to, to join in and, and uh, share in the summit and other, uh, other professional learning as well. But let's launch into learning a little bit about our new CEO. And um, I'm very excited. We went through a, a very elaborate process and ended up with someone who I count as uh, just one of the exceptional uh, individuals in the field, an individual who has really de you devoted, Lindsay, your life to this work, uh, first as, a, as an attorney and an advocate in education. Uh, then working with the Council for Exceptional Children, and then, you know, first in, in the area of policy with the National Center for Learning Disabilities, but then taking that on and, and being CEO. So uh, you've worked in the disability rights and education field for a long time, and I know this is a passion for you. So let me just begin by asking what motivated you to focus on this work? Yeah, well, it's so great to be here with you today, and I'm so proud and honored to join this incredible cast team. Uh, and I and the work is so exciting. It is just I can't uh, even imagine it. That I've been here seven weeks, and I've learned so much about everything that's happening. And it really is um, every day. It kind of brings me back to why I started in this field over 20 years ago. And that is like many, many people out there, that's because I come from a family of educators, mm -hmm. a family um, who around the dinner table talked about education, about kids, about how they learn, about, got very interested very early on in individuals with disabilities. All of, all of the sort of people in my family worked in classrooms before IDEA was passed and after. Um, and really, you know, that that passion that they had for it and little did I know sort of some of the experiences that I had with them drove me and drive me still today. And there's one that really stands out to me um, and really even, you know, how you age and some things, you know, you think of them over and over and, and maybe they become a touchstone for you in ways that you didn't even notice them in the same way when you were kind of mm -hmm. when you were younger. And that for me is my mother. Uh, taught as a special education teacher in a elementary school in Lakewood, Ohio, public elementary school. She later went on to be a special director and many other things in education, but I would go to her school 
every morning. I went to a school next door every morning and every afternoon. And I went to a classroom and probably lots of people have had their children in their classrooms before and after. Um, but her classroom was down, it was on the first floor of this building, down a really long hallway. And it was quiet down that hallway till you got to the door of her classroom where it was bursting with energy, lots of children, lots of activity, um, but very separate from the rest of the school, very separate for the whole day. And I know there are classrooms today in our schools that are still separate, many, many fewer. We've made incredible progress, uh, but that just, that image, um, the, the children that I met and became friends with in that room very naturally and normally, all of the work around that just made an impression on me that separate is not equal. And we all are losing out by not fully including everybody and more than including what I'm excited about cast. It's just, it's, it is inclusion, but it's really about creating an environment of belonging where you know you belong there. And so I think CAST works for that every day, and I'm proud to be a part of it. That's, uh, that's exciting. You know, the, that, that personal experience is so vital. And uh, I know for me, I, I, one of my uh, children has Down syndrome, and so it's, it's been a real insight into uh, deepening my understanding of, of what it means to be inclusive of all individuals and what that each individual uh, contributes in in particular ways and that we all are a community and i think that's part of the the breakthrough that um you know cast and and really the the disability rights community uh has made over the last number of years and you've watched the evolution of uh of this work and as, as you look back on your you know your prior work as an advocate and with nCLD you know, what stands, stands out as some major advances uh, for individuals with disabilities over that time? Oh yeah, I mean, so many really, actually. Um, I started practicing law in 2001, which was basically the year that No Child Left Behind was passed. Mm -hmm. And I was helping school districts implement um, what really was a big advance for students with disabilities at that time, because it, students with disabilities for all of the other parts of it, we're required to be included in accountability systems and in, um, in the standardized tests that they were giving at that time. And that was a big structural change in many of the schools that I was working in in Arizona, as they were really trying to grapple with, how do we do this? This is a, this is a structural change. And that caused a real advancement. Um, it just pushed the field forward for all the the, the bad <laughs> or the negative sort of implications of No Child Left Behind, of which there are many. One of the really bright spots was including um, students in systems. And I can remember when I was at the Council for Exceptional Children, so many uh, teachers, special education teachers telling me, once that happened, it was the first time the principal ever walked in my room and asked, how is this? How is this going? What? How are you teaching? Will they advance? Will your children advance? So that it seems amazing to me in some ways to think that in in two thousand one, which doesn't seem that long ago, that we still had some of those separations in place. I'd say fast forward twenty years, our numbers of children included in classrooms have um, skyrocketed. Uh, mm -hmm. as you can see with the Department of Ed data and the ways that we serve them and the ways that we think about it um, have advanced innumerably. So I, I think the advance, there's so much more to do, but the advances that happened um, have driven real progress for all kids. That's the best part of it, right? Is that it's for everyone. When you design for the margins, you're really, the secret is you're really designing for everybody. You're making the room and the curriculum and the space and every part of it, the learning environment, better for everyone. So there have definitely been those types of advances, um, but we do have a long way to go. Yeah. You know, I, I, when I think about the, the contributions that CAST has made um, over time and just the, the core concept of UDL and universal universally designing instruction and the, the thought that we're not fixing the student, but we're actually fixing the, the school and fixing instruction and fixing curriculum to increase access. And then, and that 
you know, we're not teaching to the average. We're actually saying that uh, you know, there's a natural variability and that variability is where we need to stretch our instruction so that we are ultimately inclusive. Um, and just that, that it, it impacts everyone that, you know, when you do a curb cut, it not only helps, you know, individuals with disabilities, but those who have children who are, uh, you know, in a, in a uh, you know, that you're wheeling along the this, this street or as an individual with a bicycle or what, you know, a whole range of individuals. So we've learned a lot of lessons, but what do you see is, uh, you know, some of the barriers now that are still getting in the way of creating those kinds of inclusive environments? Yeah, I think, I mean, the top barrier, absolutely the top barrier continues to be mindsets of individuals um, who are in the work, I think. And I, you know, to me, what's so exciting about CAST, I, when I think about CAST, I think about, you know, the thing that is so amazing is the respect that it shows for educators, the respect that it shows for students. I believe at CAST, you know, we believe everyone can be an expert learner, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited to work with this team because that's our foundational perspective. Everyone can be an expert learner. And when we leverage the power of the learning sciences and the research-based framework that we developed, Universal Design for Learning, to create environments and tools and technologies that are flexible, accessible, and empowering for all, there's nothing that we can't do. And when you look today, some of the real barriers in schools remain misunderstanding about funding streams, like not to get too detailed, but a lot of people don't understand the flexibility they have to use funds to benefit all children. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big issue, right? Some of the barriers remain um, a mindset that accessible technology is an add-on. It's separate. It's too expensive. I just got had a call last week with uh, Jennifer Levine, our head of professional learning and a team of people we were talking to and again was told, you know, we're trying to do a lot to create our product and it's hard to have so many priorities, you know, that means accessibility kind of falls down the list. And it's like, not to me, it doesn't, <laughs> like, you know, like, uh, well, then let's explore why, because it needs to be built in. And I think that, but that kind of um, thinking has to change. And I do think CAST has been extremely successful in um, putting forward this idea along with many in the field who are looking at learning sciences, and you know well, of course, in your work uh, yeah. around the science of learning and other things. But this idea that we've built these systems for the mythical average, uh, mm -hmm. when we know that we should be assuming variability. To us on this call, I would imagine, I know to the board and I know to the team, that's a, we now assume variability, right? We assume variability as the norm. But I think we still have to push that message with others who are thinking and aren't thinking as flexibly. But I'm so excited by, you know, so many different things I could talk about here at CAST that are happening. But just because of this particular thing that happened, our professional learning, the way our professional learning is working in New Hampshire, in California, and around the world, actually, is redesigning professional learning. It's making the learning itself universally designed. It, mm -hmm. And it really, it's empowering the expert learner who are teachers and educators. And it is empower, they then are empowering the students who are expert learners about themselves and about how they learn. That is gonna change the world. It already has absolutely revolutionized so much in the way we think. And now I think we're at this place where the next frontier for that is really exciting. Yeah. If I could just add, there are a couple comments in uh, the chat that are resonating that you all are sharing about, and one is just really around belonging, and the include how important inclusion and the feeling of belonging are, how how tightly related they are. The more inclusive the practices, the more belonging the learners can feel, and that can lead to this expert learning that you're describing, Lindsay. So I just want to thank you all for as you're making these connections, sharing them with us in the chat because they're incredibly important. And there is one quick clarification question that came in, and that is, could you define expert learner? 
I, yes, I'll give you my definition for expert learner. And I think it's short and simple. It is, it is a person who understands what they need to learn and then is in an environment that allows them to learn that information. So I do think we, everybody can be an expert learner. What we have to do is remove the barriers in our environment that are stopping them from getting the access to the information they need. And we need to empower them to understand themselves and how their brain works. Uh, you know, at my work at the National Center for Learning Disabilities, and this goes to the disability rights movement in general, which is the way we use the word disability. And Shelly, you know this better than anybody. The way we use that word has changed over the years so dramatically. And when I started practicing law, um, and I knew from my family that it's, we used person first language at my dinner table, right? We were person first language. Right. And I understood why, right? Because you're not defined by just one aspect of your personality. None of us are, we're all intersectional. We all have different elements. And now you fast forward to today where I'm working with incredible disability rights activists who are reclaiming, saying I am a disabled person. And they're saying it as a political statement and it's how they describe themselves. I also worked with individuals who wanted more information and wanted to say something more specific about themselves. I am a dyslexic. I have ADHD. I, and, and they found power in that. So I'm using that just as a, just as a way to talk about it. Belonging to me means you, it's assumed you're going to be in the conversation. Of course, you'll be there. There's space for you. You can take up space and you can use language about yourself that you feel empowers you. And we don't define for you how you speak about who you are. And I think CAST embodies that and universal design for learning embodies that spirit um, and is a, is a very active and vital part of the disability rights movement. And of course, uh, the human movement in that way uh, right. across all different areas. So. And, and what we know from the research as well, whether it's in belonging and the social emotional learning end of this, or whether it's in the universal design for learning, and uh, both are mutually supportive, is that uh, student performance is enhanced and uh, students do better uh, when they feel welcome, when they feel they have a role, when they feel like a sense of connection to others and to adults and, and uh, as well as uh, can access the curriculum effectively. And, you know, the, I think the, uh, the guidelines that, that uh, CAST formulated um, and helped the field formulate, uh, where we are looking at, you know, multiple means of representation, engagement, and expression, uh, is just such a breakthrough concept for educators that it, we can grapple with this. We can actually change the way we design instruction uh, so that we are enabling all students to participate in ways that really resonate uh, with their, their skills and talents. Um, it's really one of the things I, I relish about the work in UDL is that it's such an asset-based approach. And it, it emphasizes the assets that each individual brings to, to uh, their learning. And uh, if we can uh, open up our understanding and our appreciation, uh, which is, a, I think, the, the work that you had suggested CAS is doing in professional learning is probably some of the most critical work uh, viewed from a superintendent's perspective. You know, we all walk into education having experienced education, experienced essentially outdated education. And then we have to transform our own understanding because our experience is so different. And so in that transformation, we begin to see the possibilities. You know, let me uh, back up just a little bit, though, and, and uh, talk more organizationally. I will come back to the, the, these concepts. But, you know, you, you had deep commitments, you know, to uh, this work with the, the council and then with NCLD. Um, why cast for you? Why, why did you say, this is the opportunity I want to take advantage of? What, what did you mm -hmm. see in cast that made you say, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring and, and, and see if I can contribute to this organization? Um, it's such a good question. I, 
I were I I was a supporter from the outside, let's say from CEC um, and NCLD for years, um, and definitely lobbying for UDL to be included along with others in legislation. And I just I have to say from the outside, to me always cast is an it's just an inspirational and innovative organization it's revolutionizing learning design around the world and i could see that from my perch in the sort of education policy world and i i have to say i mean i'm especially excited to join at this time because in the wake of the societal shifts that we've faced over the last couple of years very rightly and that we need to dig into and 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 continue to work on and also in the face of the what's happened to education in the pan, during the pandemic mm -hmm. um we can't go back to old models and we shouldn't and i think i spoke with in my position from ncld i spoke with so many educators across the nation during the pandemic trying to figure out what's happening on the ground what can we do in policy? What kind of things can we push for? What, where should funding be tailored? What should we be lobbying for? What do you need, right? Mm -hmm. How do we get you what you need? And it really reinforced for me um, that part of what that is, is CAST's work to remove these barriers. It's innovation. What they, it's a great moment in, some, in so many ways that I was really drawn to the work of CAST and I feel like it's so critical at this time. It's, it is not many groups have actually worked on how to reach such a broad audience um, in some of these hybrid ways that I think will be with us forever. And CAST has been trying to say to people for years and we've been those supporters of UDL, let's shake it up. We created the system. Yeah. let's change it doesn't it have to be this way you know i mean and i just wanted to be a part of that i wanted to be a part of kind of shaking that up and saying let's you know there's so much good work happening at cast let's get it out there and let's make sure we're making a difference with it a real difference mm -hmm. um, yeah. so you know with the the uh mission statement of until learning has no limits what, what does that mean to you how do you how do you take that and own it and, and how do you, how, what's the vision you bring to that? Well, I mean, what I'll say now, and, and to me, it means respect and belonging. It, those two things, that's what it means. Until learning has no limits, until it's a, to me, the word until is that we are striving and I'm an advocate. And so I see, I'm just sort of an advocate at heart. And I see myself as working until learning has no limits because of the respect and belonging that we have to imbue, include in any of our systems. And every day I get to come to work and I get the great honor and the great pleasure to work with talented people who are striving to create a world where every learner understands how they learn what they need to learn. That's the goal, right? And where learning environments don't assume that invented norm, don't make accommodations for everyone else, but they're designed with variability in mind. And I, I view it as a charge. I get up and I get to be with great people who are like, let's go until learning has no limits. <laughs> <laughs> And and that's expanded. Uh, CAS has expanded beyond the educational environment as well. Looking at the work environment, do you want to say a little bit about that? I do. This is so exciting, and I think it makes it's just it's makes a lot of sense, and it's so you it's so important right now. This area that we have um, around workplace, around the transition, tr workforce training career technical education. CAST has carved out some incredible work in that area and is really um, beginning to push the boundaries. You know, I know from all of us who've been in, in education in any way, no transition to workforce is a critical, critical part of sometimes not addressed as much, I mean, you know, K-12 can drop off but we know people's lives go on and we also are learning so much more now about what we need to do, how we can support and how we can really address the, the needs of all populations. And so our workforce team is doing some incredible work in those exactly those areas, workforce, 
um, preparation, instruction, with Job Corps, with a whole bunch of programs, Youth Build, all over the nation, partnering with those. And then also focusing in on some of the career and technical education programs. And they're doing, they've got some really cool stuff where they're bringing universal design into all these settings, maker space. I don't know if people have heard of those, but jump on our website. There's amazing videos about those. Um, they're doing, they're just kind of infusing it into all of those areas. And we know how critical that period of time is. Um, and so it's, it's exciting to see CAST pushing forward in that way. Now, I know this is a, a little bit early to ask this kind of question, but let me, because you've only been at CAST for a month, um, but you've observed CAST for, a, for quite a long time. Uh, right. But what, what excites you most about the work that CAST is currently, currently has underway? Well, it's so much, but I have to say UDL Rising to Equity. UDL Rising to Equity is, uh, it is essential for the entire um, field. It mm -hmm. is something that drew me to CAST. CAST created the, uni the Universal Design for gui Learning Guidelines. And the UDL Rising to Equity is really taking a deep and careful look at those and saying, have we addressed all of the audience? Are we looking at learners as, intersec as intersectional people, right? Are we looking at all parts of their lives and how can we do a better job? Bilingual education, right? English language learners. How are we looking at that, uh, that group of learners' unique needs and applying universal design? How do they fit in, right? Um, race, equity, poverty. To me, diversity of thought and moving forward, um, understanding and incorporating and respecting those experiences will create something that will uh, in could, will be the sort of 2.0 of revolutionizing the field. It's essential work. Uh, everyone at CAST is deeply committed to it. And it's exciting because I think it's going to open up even, not only will we reach a much broader audience that we, um, it's a great way to connect with the community and make sure their voice is heard and is a part of those guidelines um, and our world moving forward. So I'm really excited about that as an initiative. Uh, I think it's terrific that CAST is leading it and taking it on. And I can't wait to um, continue to work on that. Yeah, I think that that's a, such a critical concept. We've um, you know, often think of UDL as really related to individuals with disabilities. And, uh, and yet the concepts apply to culture. They apply to race. They apply to you know, a whole range mm -hmm. of uh, experiences. Uh, it applies to students who have experienced trauma. It's the, the same, the same core concepts within UDL uh, apply to the full range of students who come to us with a variety of needs and that we can broaden the concept so that we're stretching uh, and enabling all students to be successful, I think is a, is a powerful uh, future direction and, and future work that GAST has undertaken. And it's, it's really exciting to see. I, you know, one of the things that, that strikes me as a superintendent, you know, the, and I think CAST started to some degree this way in terms of looking at technology and, and accessibility. And, and still, you know, the uh, CAST uh, possesses two of the key centers around national centers, the AIMS Center, for example, and, and the Center for Inclusive Technology and Educational Systems. Uh, you know, th these are major national centers around accessibility. Um, and at the same time, what I think we've realized is that it's in the mindset of people that we is the most dramatic change. And uh, I think what excites me as well is the professional development work, the transformative professional development work that CAS has undertaken uh, with school districts and transforming their thinking. Um, because, you know, frankly, I think the work we do to create inclusive mindsets is uh, so powerful. Um, and that inclusiveness, as you've just articulated, includes everyone. Um, you know, no matter what their background, what their experience, uh, what their culture or ethnicity or race, 
And I think that the, the stretching us to think about what does it mean to have an inclusive mindset is, is a, a powerful concept and one that I think Cass has been a leader for you know the 38 years it's been in existence. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's great to see this stretch um, and, and be applied in an even broader context. So as, as you look to the future, you know, what are some of your goals for CAST and some of the directions and initiatives that you see CAST pursuing? Well, I mean, I think it's, look, I, I think one of the most important areas facing our nation right now, and that's going to remain with us for the next five to 10 years, is um, the impact the pandemic and just the overall sort of tone and tenor of discussions about educators is having on educators in our field. We're seeing educators leave education at the highest rates we've ever seen. And to be clear, before the pandemic, mm -hmm. special education reported shortages, I think in all 50 states, maybe 48 states, Right. We were already facing some of these shortage issues, and now they're becoming dramatic. And they're becoming dramatic, not just with educators leaving the profession, but also in the dropping rates of those who are entering teacher preparation programs. And this is, you know, it's happening right now in sort of a way that, that is a little, it's not as it doesn't feel like an immediate crisis, maybe, but it is. And I really believe that UDL shows incredible respect for the educator. It's not a program that gives you a script that you read and then you <laughs> kind of, you know, it tells you don't think, just be, be a robot, do this, and you'll get X result. Not at all. I think it shows profound respect for the educator um, as an expert learner, as someone who um, understands how they move forward. And I think CAST has to continue to play a role in that arena in demonstrating how educate the profession itself is honorable. It's important. It's the backbone of our society. And we mm -hmm. UDL um, empowers in that way. Mm -hmm. The next area that I think we need to really, of course, UDL, the, rising to equity throughout everything, right? That, that goes without being said, and I think it's gonna open up a lot of great areas for CAS to work in. A lot of um, interesting things with SEL, with social emotional learning, with English language learners. We're doing incredible work in California, learning, there's a lot to be learned there and to be shared. Um, and I, you know, I could also see um, there's, there are kind of these new technologies the one I think we're hearing the most about in education and workforce is artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. How are we using artificial intelligence? Is artificial, it, it could potentially be fraught with barriers um, if it's created in ways that are not inclusive and where they're, they're not inclusive of people with disabilities of, of all types of the inclusivity that we've been talking about. That's an interesting area that keeps getting raised um, up in many different ways. And I'm very um, focused on understanding that the possibilities that are there in that arena, what's happening there, and whether uh, just ensuring that we're not creating systems that do have barriers that are coming up in place. I mean, the thing about a barrier is you don't see it if it does, if you don't run into it. <laughs> you know, okay. so you might not see these barriers, even if you're kind of bumping into it, but you're still able to get by it, you don't see it. And so we've got a great team of incredible thinkers and innovators. And I hope that those in the community, in our, um, our whole incredible sort of UDL community are thinking about these, these types of things because they have a unique ability already to kind of be uh, focused on where are these barriers? You know, the last thing I'll say that's just about this, that's so interesting and important is CAST, had been doing a lot of professional learning in New Hampshire, as you know well, um, Shelley, for many years. And so they had data that, that CAST has been collecting data on teacher, how te teacher mindsets basically. And they could see when the pandemic hit and they were still working in those schools, what the data showed is for those teachers who'd been in UDL, who'd been learning it say for two years, that 
they responded to the pandemic in a much more flexible way. They were ready. It's a barrier. Oh, there's a new set of barriers. It wasn't that it wasn't scary. We were all scared, right? It wasn't that it was simply, there's a new set of barriers. How do I respond to them? And that is a profound shift for any human, right? That's great. And I feel like we've got to um, really deeply understand that and deeply understand kind of what is, uh, how, what does that tell us about the path forward as well? Mm-hmm. And if I could just hop in, because there are a couple of questions that are connecting exactly to what you all are talking about. And one is around that mind shift that can take place, that's really important to take place, the assumptions that we're making um, about learning, and um, even thinking about variability in terms of bilingual opportunities, international opportunities. So as as you're thinking, um, Lindsay, and sharing about how we can address these barriers, um, what opportunities or what, what, what do you see as um, options to really help think about that mind shift that you're talking about in the approach? I mean, I think, <laughs> I think one of the first things, a huge opportunity is um, making sure more people know about the work that CAST is doing and the impact that it's having. I think that's always hard. Our society is, we, I mean, how many emails did you get today? I could say to anybody on this, right? You're overwhelmed with information in many ways. So there is a part of this that's like, we need to get more information out uh, to the field in general and be in these conversations in a more public way. The next part is we have to take a deep look at our own information right now and research what we are doing and what others in the field are doing around this so that we can clarify what is actually working. And I think the third thing is we need good partners that's a huge opportunity for us. We have, CAST has a ton of partners, the AIMS Center, our Accessible Educational Materials. I could name all of our centers. They have fantastic advisory boards. They have great, we have a national cadre for both workforce and for professional learning, all critical, incredible experts in their fields. I think we can, we need to think through some of those partnerships and how we're leveraging them to make our own work better and to make our community more broadly, a part of all of the education conversations that are happening. And uh, we have a, an, an offer coming in from, um, from Boris in Chile saying that um, <laughs> there's a lot of great work going on there and that um, they're excited to venture forward with us. So thank you for that note. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And you know, that Boris, that is such a, I'm glad you raised that because one of the things that I've been really looking at in these first few weeks is um, kind of mapping the global environment um, and how UDL has really been, um, it, it is all over the world. And how can we make sure we're doing something to support our global community and understanding that more? So I appreciate you raising that. And I think that's just really exciting. You know, the best thing you can do is have people from different places, people from different backgrounds and people with different perspectives in one conversation, because then you, you have a much richer outcome the last thing we want is all people from the same viewpoint um, just telling us the same things over and over. So I think the future is in that sort of productive uh, conversation and, uh, you know, discussions about where we go. And the, the interest in uh, UDL internationally is extraordinary. Um, and it, this isn't just a uh, movement within the United States. It's a really an international movement. And some of the work that uh, we're we're doing with the IRN and uh, you know the um, and just pulling together individuals from a variety of countries uh, to to be thought leaders uh, is is critically important. You know, I, I want to return to the theme of mindset and and how we transform that mindset. Because you know, one of the from a superintendent's perspective, what I what I see is, is and one of the things that so interests me about Cass' work is that I've always viewed teaching as uh, being an art form. Um, that teachers are really artists, and that UDL enables teachers to have a framework. Uh, within which to, you know, design and paint and, and 
uh, orchestrate their classroom. And so in essence, we are providing, and CAS has provided critical tools uh, for teachers and administrators to take the next steps. And, you know, I've seen it in, in simply in the, not only in the design of instruction, but in the furniture that we're now purchasing for classrooms, uh, in the way that we uh, look at assessment and look at expression uh, and enabling students to uh, express themselves in a variety of ways. Um, you know, we still are, are uh, deeply tied to the testing movement in our country, but it uh, but in so many ways, there are such vital and uh, demonstrative ways of, of showing what students know and what they're learning. And that, that palette that we've created, that UDL has created, has broadened teachers' ability to say, I can actually reach more students by adapting these concepts. So I... I I think that your comments about um, the, the critical nature of transforming, you know, teachers thinking and the professional development and the work on mindsets is, is such a vital role that, that CAST has, has played. You know, what also strikes me, and, and I'd just love to hear your reactions, is that, you know, at one time, uh, CAST was more focused on uh, you know, technology and developing technology and broadening the concept. And now there's a professional learning, there's uh, books that are coming out on a, a really regular basis, ter terrific literature. Um, there's a cast as a convener, uh, cast as a policy leader. You know, how do you pull all of these strands together and, and, uh, you know, and and make that uh, organization work with so many arms and so many different needs, actually. Yeah, I, you know, so the first thing I'd say there is, I think that what a wonderful, even as you just described it, what an incredible organization, right? It started in some ways, and probably some would would disagree with me, by saying this, but like we have a theory, right? We have a theory on a shelf in some ways, which we don't want. And CAST I think was formed and its trajectory changed because it's about, does this work, right? And when I spoke with the board, when I speak with the founders and if they put pretty, pretty succinctly what they wanted to accomplish, they wanted to change the world. They wanted to change the world of education. And now look at what CAST has done right? Allison's whole, a great book that Mindy, you have to put in the chat, Unlearning, amazing book, right? There's so many good books. Hopefully Mindy puts them in the chat, <laughs> but I'm seeing Allison here. But I, so I look at that and say, so that was Cass' second phase, right? First they came up with the UDL guidelines. They came up and then it was like, how do we get people using these? And how do we see how we can make that? Because it's about, there's an urgency, to getting to the children, right? And fixing it. And children just get older and older and it's quick. Mm -hmm. I think the future is saying, all right, we've our space is, is education across the lifetime. Let's make some decisions about what are some real goals we've been now implementing. We've got all of, we've got publishing. We've got credentials now. We're certifying schools in mm -hmm. this. What the next phase sort of is, is, okay, what do we want to see our impact be in five years? What do we want that to be? Because if we don't out, if we don't say what it is, we won't do it. We'll study it. We'll, and I'd say that about my own self, any, you know what I mean? Like, if you don't have it, you don't do it. So I think that's the phase. It's like, all right, let's take stock of this incredible organization, all that it's doing, all that it has to all of its national centers, incredible grants, technologies, tools, e-portfolio, um, the workforce work, the actual in the school deep learning work, the publishing that's grounding and providing credible and credibility and credible resources and credibility in the field. And the same with our credentials. And what's what's possible? How do we do this going forward? So I didn't give you a perfect answer on that one. It is only my seventh week. 
Yes. Well, you know, but like, I'm excited for it. <laughs> well, you know, what what strikes me is that uh, Cass has the critical levers to make those changes. And I think for everybody who's uh, viewing this now and, and who will view it in the future is it's, it'll be posted on the on the website and we hope that many others view it. Um, it's an invitation to join in the work and to you know participate and and to uh, you know, support this in whatever way so that we we move forward. But you know, it does take policy leadership and it does take research and it does take the design work and professional development work. And that the in-depth work that's going on in New Hampshire and California will uh, provide lessons for us in implementation. And what does it mean to do deep implementation? So I, I think the, as we look to the future, uh, all of these uh, various strategies and uh, you know, programs within CAST uh, really merge into one movement of uh, moving us forward. And I, I think it's, it's so exciting that, that you're now in that leadership role. I, I want to, we don't have that much time left, but I, I do want to ask you, you know, since you posed the question of five years from now, where do we want to be? I want to ask, what do you see? As five years from now, what would you like to be able to say that CAS has been able to achieve? Well, I'll say I'm all about action. I'm action biased, uh -huh. right? And I will definitely, the top of the list, I want to see, um, I would like to see that we see widespread adoption and of, of, of the new UDL guidelines that are the rise that reflect rising to equity, mm -hmm. that we see that as a successful transition to those guidelines and that they grow even that, that our work around that grows even beyond. I also think I really want to see us. Um, I want to see us sparking some conversations that we haven't had yet necessarily. Um, what, what are those new what are the markets we need to be creating what are they i'd like to see us at least have a process around i want to see us creating those markets creating some markets that we don't have mm -hmm. i think our professional learning can get to and our workforce work um we need to uh, i'd love to see us quantify some of that work and determine where are we going to have some states maybe full states if not the nation that we can say that's a udl state right there so mm -hmm. I think there's a whole bunch of stuff like that that we need to think about. Um, and I've probably just given many people on the cast team heart attacks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, don't hold me to it. But I think that's exciting. And I will tell you every single day, right? At least right now, until learning has no limits. <laughs> that's great. You know, I, I would say that you know, cast has been very fortunate in uh, in terms of having a, a long line of very talented and committed leaders um, that, you know, stretching back to David Rose and, and Ann Meyer at the beginning, uh, Ada Sullivan coming in and, and leading the organization, uh, Linda Gerstel picking up the baton um, and carrying it forward from Ada's work. And then now you uh, picking up the baton and taking a, a cast to the next level. Um, it, it's just very exciting to have you on board, have your, you know, the kind of energy, enthusiasm and advocacy and, and experience that you bring to CAST. Uh, I, I know that we're all confident that uh, it will help CAST move to that next level and, and uh, broaden the work and, and actually uh, change the world as you've, as you've articulated, because um, this is, there couldn't be a, as I see it, a more critical uh, task and uh, as creating that kind of inclusive mindset and, and practices that build accessibility and inclusiveness uh, and that we can now take that forward and, and hopefully achieve a piece of that mission of until learning has no limits, not only in the United States, but in a, a broader context of the world at large. So I want to thank you for joining CAST. 
it's um, we're all excited. I know the staff is excited, the board is excited, and and uh, we see a very positive future ahead. And I would encourage all of those who have uh, uh, joined this conversation to uh, you know continue to stay with us and and continue to. Uh, advocate and, and work on and collaborate with CAST in, in uh, the many ways that you're already doing. So I'm going to turn this back to Allison to, to uh, wrap us up. But, uh, Lindsay, thank you very much for uh, all that you've offered. And uh, I want to thank all those who've joined us for this call as well. Thank you so much. So, so proud to be a member of this incredible team. And Shelly, that was so well said there. And I do want to just note there were many questions that came in. And hopefully the, the questions around partnerships with ed tech groups, partnerships around the globe, um, partnerships in terms of thinking about bilingual opportunities for bilingual learners. Hopefully you started to see some connections there. And please keep reaching out. We have as they mentioned, as Lindsay mentioned, great books, great professional learning, great opportunities for collaboration. There are some folks on um, participating today who really helped us deeply understand implementation, like George Van Horn. I want to give a call out to him and um, Alexis Reed, Grace Grace Mayo. So, so you know, just thank you all for being and for being on this UDL journey with us um, and the next stages that it will go um, to. We always like to give you all. Um, uh, an opportunity to check out one of those books. So Cast Publishing is offering a 20% discount on pre-orders of UDL Now, the third edition by the one and only Katie Novak. So um, this third edition has all you need to know to get to um, start applying UDL in your classroom. So uh, use the code SPRING SPRING22. Uh, and you have until May 15th for this discount. And be sure to visit all the other exciting um, titles that CAST Publishing has. Thank you, Mindy, for um, putting all of that information in the chat. That's fabulous. Um, we want to remind you that you do have the digital handout. This has the outline of our discussion topics, the links that have been mentioned during the discussion, and additional information about Lindsay, Shelley, and CAST are on this digital handout. So please uh, check that out. And finally, please keep up with the latest news, the research that's going on at CAST, the tools, the events that we want to participate with you all in. Uh, you can sign up for our CAST free newsletter. So visit the bit.ly slash CAST hyphen newsletter today. Those are all lowercase bit.ly slash CAST dash newsletter. So we would love to keep in touch with you all. And finally, we thank you all for being here today. Some of the, the um, I like to take notes on some of the comments and words that are mentioned. So we heard transformation, engagement. Shelly, you use the word stretch a lot. And I like to think of that as, you know, let's continue to stretch and grow. Innovation, devotion, advocating, belonging, inclusion. So just some really powerful final words that um, we invite you all to share a final word that you may take with you from this webinar. And please share your feedback on the webinar. So you can go to our bit.ly slash Jones dash post dash dash survey and let us know, you know, how was this webinar? What ideas do you have for future webinars? We'd really like to know so we can bring those to you all. Um, I also want to thank our amazing back channel team. They are fabulous. Thank you again to Lisa, our captioner. And thank you all for joining today um, and participating with us. We hope these conversations continue. Shelly and Lindsay, I don't know if you have any final words that you would like to share. It can be a single word. <laughs> you offered many amazing words during this conversation. I just want to thank everybody and thank Lindsay, but I, I think I'll leave the last word to Lindsay. <laughs> yeah, I want to say how excited I am. What a fun conversation it was because it's fun to think about the future here. Uh, there's incredible, talented people, and there's so much work to do. And thanks so much to Shelly. Uh, it was exciting and fun. So let's do it. Fun <laughs> keep, is a good coming, word. keep coming to cast, everybody. <laughs> we need you. Hi, George Van Horn. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, have a fabulous day and please keep in touch with us. Thank you all.